Bonjour à toutes et tous, je m'appelle Frédéric Meunier, je suis professeur de géopolitique à Schema Business School et je suis également directeur de l'école de géopolitique de, de Schema qui ambitionne de traiter des thèmes de géopolitique qui aujourd'hui intéressent le monde dans lequel nous vivons et nous vivrons. Euh, J'ai le plaisir aujourd'hui de recevoir Simon Chadwick, euh, professeur, collègue et ami, professeur d'économie géopolitique euh, du sport à Schema Business School. Nous nous retrouvons ici dans le cadre également du think tank Schema Publica, qui est un think tank international, indépendant, qui a pour but aujourd'hui eh d'étudier les transformations sociétales, géopolitiques du monde dans lequel nous sommes. Alors je vais commencer cette interview, alors pour des questions de commodité, eh bien, je parlerai, nous parlerons chacun dans les langues dans lesquelles nous sommes les plus accoutumés, moi en français, et Simon parlera en, en anglais bien sûr. Euh, première question, Simon, it's my first question, est-ce que vous pourriez vous présenter en quelques mots, vous, mais également le livre qui nous occupe aujourd'hui, un livre donc, que vous allez sortir dans quelques, dans quelques semaines et qui s'appelle donc l'économie géopolitique du sport so thank you for, uh inviting me here today to uh, to introduce myself and to talk about the book. It's a pleasure. I am a professor of sport and geopolitical economy. Um, I started off as a sports fan, and here I am now. Uh, probably far less of a sports fan and, and much more of a, a person who is interested in the world and in countries and relationships between countries, uh, and also the relationship between people and, and the cultures that, uh, that, that they live within. With all of this in mind, um, I decided uh, in 2022, at the start of 2022, to produce the book in conjunction with uh, my ed editorial colleagues, but also in conjunction with um, a whole series of really, really great academics and other writers who've contributed to, to the book. And I suppose the book was of its time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in 50 years' time or 100 years' time, it'll seem really old-fashioned. But I think that when we conceived of the book and, and when we obviously began to, to, to compile it and now it's published, it hopefully really captures our time. And, and not just in sport, but I think more generally across the world, the, 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 the state of geopolitical relations. Mm -hmm. Merci beaucoup. Um, J'aimerais passer à notre deuxième question. Euh, le livre donc, que vous éditez s'appelle « L'économie géopolitique du sport ». Ce titre m'intrigue. En effet, la géopolitique se définit généralement comme l'étude des rapports de force dans l'espace. Mais alors, comment définir, how would you define, l'économie géopolitique du sport, d'une part, et la géopolitique du sport, d'autre part Pouvez-vous nous éclairer sur ces, sur ces concepts, ces topics That's a really interesting question because I'm not a geopolitician by background. Um, my first degree was actually economics. My PhD was on sport, sport sponsorship. Um, but I'm always uh, interested in geography. When I, was a, when I was a kid, I was a big fan of geography and countries and traveling, and, and I still am. But over the last decade, certainly in my work, for example, on sponsorship, what I began to notice is is that there was an increasing number of sponsors mm -hmm. uh, that weren't private companies. Uh, they were state-owned entities, state-owned corporations. And in particular here, I think about, um, for example, Gulf region airlines like Emirates, Qatar Airways, Etihad. And they increasingly um, began to construct portfolios of sports sponsorship properties. So if we take Emirates Airline as, 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 as one example, uh, lots of sponsorships in football and a, a stadium naming rights deal with Arsenal. Uh, a PSG. Initially PSG, obviously now in, in Lyon. Mm -hmm. um, probably highest profile of all, a shirt sponsorship deal with Real Madrid. And Emirates, because it's not a private company, because it is a state-run airline, uh, clearly the parameters of, of, of its operations and the way it was making decisions would, would be different to, for example, a car company or a mobile phone company, for example. And so it became apparent to me that, that there appeared to be this, um, this change in emphasis amongst these kinds of sponsors where they were seeking to achieve state objectives rather than pri private or commercial objectives. I'm not saying that Emirates Airlines is not, not in the business of making money and, and selling tickets and flying flying planes, but there was more to it than that. There, there was nation branding and soft power and nation building 
uh, and trying to 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 manage image and reputation. So it was really within that context of of a changing world in which there appeared to be uh, increasing state influence from what we might broadly call the global south. And that's a, that's an, an interesting term that we could talk about in its own right. Um, this demanded a, a, a change in the way that we, we, we think about sport and the way in which we, we, we write and teach sport. But alongside that, we, we can think about, for instance, um, the role of sport in China and, and, and the rise of China, both economic and, economically and politically. We can think about the Qatar World Cup. Uh, we can think about South Korea and, and, and South Korean sports strategy. For that matter, we can think about think about France and Britain, um, two countries that are all also very active economically and politically through sport. And so what we've tried to do, I think from, for the first time, is, is to uh, bring all of those things together and to un- try and understand what they are, what they mean. And, and in the context of somebody who works in a business school, what the implications are for leaders and managers. Uh, and, I, and I guess if I could just deconstruct the geopolitical economy, essentially what the book argues is, is that um, decision-making is, is, is geographic. It has geographic dimensions. So if we look at, for instance, Saudi Arabia, currently spending billions of dollars on sport, one of the reasons that they're able to do that is because of this, the geographic endowment that they have of oil and gas. You know, that, that is an outcome of their geography. Um, equally, there is a political dimension to, to what Saudi Arabia is doing, but there's a political dimension to, to, to what Britain has done, to, to what the United States has done through sport. But if we think about, um, you know, for example, again, Saudi Arabia, geographically, politically, there are issues around social cohesion, different religious groupings. Um, sport helps bring those things together. It helps address issues of social cohesion. Saudi Arabia has a, a view of itself that others across the world don't necessarily share. So politically, I think Saudi Arabia is, is trying to manage its image, manage its reputation. Some people often refer to sport washing, um, which we do which we do address in, in the book. But again, as somebody who works in a business school, there are economic dimensions to this as well. So there are economic outcomes or consequences of geography and politics. So there's money, there's jobs, there is a contribution to gross domestic product, there are taxes and exports. So the economic well-being of a country is, is, is intertwined with its geography, but also its politics too. And again, I, I go back to, to Emirates, what we have seen is, is over the last 20 years, Dubai has established itself as, as the world's biggest airport, world's busiest airport. It now has one of the world's biggest airlines. That has had an economic um, impact on Dubai as a, as a country. Uh, you know, we've got lots of tourists going into the country, lots of people going shopping, lots of people going on beach holidays to play golf and so forth. And that has been enabled to a certain extent, by the kind of sports sponsorship deals that I mentioned earlier. So through the book, what we're trying to um, understand and, and discuss is this intersection, this combination of geography, politics, and economics. Yes. Take any country in the world, Saudi Arabia, France, Britain, the United States, China, South Korea, Germany, Russia, you, you, you name the country. And I think now what we have, hopefully through the book, is a framework for understanding how um, how these countries deploy uh, sport as a, as, a, as a policy, but also sport as a strategy for national development as well. Je crois que c'est très clair ce que vous avez dit là, et vous connectez bien, vous montrez bien comment la géopolitique est en quelque sorte un prisme à travers lequel on comprend, comme vous l'avez dit, l'économie, les liens entre l'économie, la politique, euh, euh, et bien sûr la géographie. Alors précisément, vous me conduisez à ma troisième question, euh, vous avez parlé, you talk a lot about Saudi Arabia, China, and so on, vous avez parlé euh, énormément donc, de, ces, de ces pays, et ma troisième question est la suivante. Je vais vous poser cette question peut-être un peu, un peu brutale. Euh, pourquoi ces pays illibéraux euh, affectionnent-ils tellement le sport So the book really is, uh, is capturing a moment in time. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. As somebody who's been studying, writing about, teaching sport for decades, <laughs> um, yeah. centuries maybe, uh, 
it, it's clear that there are certain years that, that have been pivotal in the history of sport. And, and I think 2022 was a, was a pivotal year in the history of sport. Even ahead of 2022, it was obvious that that was going to happen because we had the Beijing Winter Olympic Games. Um, but we, we, we also had the Qatar World Cup, which was, was groundbreaking in, in many, many ways. And Russia too. The, the additional factor, which we couldn't have predicted. So in 2021, when we were looking ahead to 2022, we could never have predicted that, that the war. Russia would inv invade Ukraine. But immediately that added a, a dimension to what was already going to be a, 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 um, an interesting and challenging year. Mm -hmm. And certainly as, as far as Russia is, is concerned, you know, there are immediate ramifications from the suspension of athletes and, and teams from international competition right through to for instance, the sanctioning of, of oligarchs. And immediately I think about Roman Abramovich, who was the owner of Chelsea at the time that, that, that Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, that in itself, that, that wasn't a simple magic. Was it? it simply wasn't a case of, well, sorry, Mr. Abramovich, you're not allowed here anymore and, and, and Chelsea will just continue to exist without you. It became part of a, of a, of a much more protracted process that ultimately led to the sale of Chelsea. And, and it was complex it was legally complex it was politically complex uh in terms of preserving this asset this cultural asset this sporting asset chelsea um it's proved to be more, far more challenging i think than people realize so in essence 2022 was always going to be an interesting year but it got more interesting when when russia invaded ukraine um one thing that i would say about the book is when when you look at it we do section the book according to 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 countries countries so there is a section on china there is a section on 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 russia there is a section on the gulf region and south asia but the book is equally as applicable uh, to to europe to south america to africa to north america but i think what we did is we captured what seemed to be the big issue certainly in the global north Mm -hmm. We captured the, the, the big issues at, at one particular point in time. I've used the phrase global north and global south already. People might talk about east and west. Mm -hmm. um, people might talk about the old world and the new world. People might talk about Asia and Asia, Africa and, and northern Europe or Europe and, and North America. Western world. The Western mm -hmm. world. But what we're arguing what we're discussing what we're analyzing is a place applicable across the world in, in any particular um country what i think it's important to, to keep in mind is is we've tried to adopt quite an open agenda for the book because it's very clear that the situation as we see it in 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 europe we're sat in paris now uh, so the way in which we might look at 2022 and, and 2023 and 2024 and 2025 and, and so forth in paris mm -hmm is going to be different to how you might view the world if you were sat in Riyadh mm -hmm. or sat in Shanghai or for that matter sat in Washington DC and so we have a range of different perspectives so the the, the authors who've contributed to, to the book are from different parts of the world they are from Qatar they are from China they are from Russia but they're also from the United States from from France from Britain um, from Germany and elsewhere and that for me is really significant because the book is premised on dialogue and exchange and trying to understand and make sense of, of the world that we live in. And I think the world that we live in is is a multipolar one. Uh, the global sports system, in essence, is, is dominated by Europe mm -hmm. because many of the global sport governing bodies with which people are most familiar were established by Europeans, are based in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and their presidents largely have been European. So yeah, just to give you, give you a couple of examples, you know, we take the uh, we take FIFA, for instance. Mm -hmm. FIFA in its entire history, so FIFA, mm -hmm. 100 years old, um, pretty much, uh, in its entire history, it, is, it has only had two non-European presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them was only a, a, a kind of temporary president. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially, FIFA has had one non-European president in its entire history. If we look at the FIA, the Global Governing Body of Motorsport, again, in its entire history, uh, has never had a European, sorry, a non-European president until recently. It now has a, a president from Dubai. And that president from Dubai, I think, is really important because what it does is it illustrates for us that, that in this multipolar world, it isn't just Europeans or for that matter, North Americans who are governing sport, 
It's actually others that have the power and the influence and to a certain extent in some situations, the control to govern sport. And, and once you begin to govern sport, you control the rules, you control the system of governance, um, you dictate where events are going to take place. And, and I guess in terms of this, this shift, this pivot, mm. and people talk about, as I'm sure you know, people talk about the pivot from global north to global mm. south. And I, I take you back to summer 2010, uh, so you know, 13 years ago from now. And, and in summer 2010, who could have imagined mm. that a FIFA World Cup final mm. would be played one week before Christmas Day? Mm. It's unimaginable. Mm. That's unimaginable. And yet it just happened. Mm. In 2022, it happened. And so what we're trying to do is to understand why. Now, a lot of people will say, well, it was because of FIFA corruption or it, it was because of this reason or that reason. That tends, for me, that tends to trivialize mm. the issues. There are some really serious issues. Uh, there are countries uh, in which there are governments with the resources and increasingly with the economic and political power to exert significant control over sport. Mm. We're seeing it with Saudi Arabia. We've seen it with Qatar. Um, We've seen it with Russia over the last decade or so. Go back 100 years, 150 years, we've seen it with France, we've seen it with Britain, we've seen it with Germany and others. So we're, we're living in a world that is in a, in a state of flux, in a state of change. And again, what we're trying to do with the book is to capture that. Je crois qu'on comprend bien là ce que vous venez de dire et que effectivement le prisme est un peu léger. De, euh, et même ma question était volontairement provocante pour ça, de, de voir là l'action de régime illibéraux. On comprend bien qu'il y a un pivot. Hein, dans ce que vous dites, effectivement, et un pivot euh, du nord euh, vers le sud, très probablement. Vous avez évoqué euh, dans votre réponse à plusieurs reprises le fait que le sport, c'était un lieu de rencontre entre différents pays. Et euh, ça m'amène à, à une autre question. Euh, la compétition sportive, euh, dont votre livre fait état, euh, eh bien, fait se rencontrer des peuples qui ont différentes valeurs, euh, différentes euh, valeurs de tolérance, par exemple, ou de, en matière de, de mœurs, euh, de respect des, des minorités. Pensez-vous que le sport, c'est ma question, puisse être un outil de paix Dans le livre, à plusieurs reprises, par exemple, vous parlez de cosmopolitisme. We're here today to talk about sport. Yeah. So sport can bring people together. Uh, <laughs> even, and, and, even French and English. Even the French and the English. Okay. Uh, it can bring people together. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no doubt that, that, for me personally, but I think for a lot of people generally, The reason I, I know so many people and go to so many places and, and get involved in so many interesting things is because of sport. So I'm I'm not going to to sit here today and say you know sport sport doesn't bring people together. It does, and and it can provide the basis for peace and reconciliation. It can provide the basis for development. Um, if you look at some of the diplomatic initiatives around mm. the world. Um, I know, for instance, with the Qatar World Cup, the organizers of the tournament, uh, through its uh, project called uh, Generation Amazing, which was a legacy initiative uh, in places like Palestine and Rwanda, um, football was uh, football facilities were, were were constructed, and young people were engaged to participate in in these projects. So, you know, there's no doubt that that this happens, and and there are some great organizations across the world who are in, engaged in doing this. But I, I do think we tend to idealize sport and the role that sport plays in people's lives in terms of a positive influence because we know that also sport can be incredibly fractious. It can be incredibly troublesome. Hooliganism in Europe, for example, in football, is a prime example of how divisive sport can be. What's my question? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we know that sport can be tribal. Um, but I think sport as this book demonstrates, can also be incredibly political too. Mm -hmm. I'm very often asked, uh, you know, can't we take politics out of sport? And um, my simple answer to that question is, no, we can't. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you make a decision to um, in in develop a set of rules for a sport and you're going to have a president and that president is going to have an office and that office is located in a, in a country somewhere, These are all political decisions immediately. Mm. So my view is that sport is in, embedded within a, a, a set of political influences, political political forces, and it can't be separated from them. You know, sport is inherently political. But what I think we're now beginning to, to, to see, you know, as, as you will know, 
we've lived the last 30 years of our lives essentially in a, in a, in a world of globalization with the promotion of free trade where there is this uh, open exchange and, and that has been facilitated not just by uh, you know, kind of liberal Western values and capitalism, but by globalization as well. Uh, but we're now beginning to see the world change and, and, and countries are becoming more defensive. Mm -hmm. uh, national interest, you know, we, we think about you know, make America great again, but you've also got make Turkey great again and, and make China great again and make Britain great again. So we, we're seeing a much more nationalistic mm -hmm. uh, view. Um, certainly in, in some sectors there, there is a move towards protecting mm -hmm. domestic industry and domestic values and trying to uphold a particular way of life. And that is beginning to play through in sport now. And, and so what we, what we are seeing, for instance, through deployment of policy and strategy in sport is countries trying to protect their own sports and trying to develop their own sport economies. They're, they're not necessarily interested in free trade. And, and kind of mutual benefit by 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 engaging with others. There's a, a much more of a self orientation. And and if you look at the origins of geopolitics, and, and you will know this, you know they, the origin the origins of, of geopolitics as a concept really go go back to around the time of the Second World War. You know, associated often with the rise of Nazi Nazi Germany. And and I think that's a really important point to stress because there is this popular discourse about geopolitics. Mm -hmm that somehow it's it's super cool and sexy and a really interesting topic. It does have its origins in, in trying to but understand the rise of the Nazi Germany. Of course. Yeah. And and and, and if we, we imagine Nazi Germany, and if we think about the role that sport played mm -hmm. in Nazi Germany, and I'm thinking specifically here of the Berlin, Berlin well, Olympics in 1936, you know, this, is, this is the territory that we're now in. Now, I'm not predicting a war. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying there's about to be a world war, but certainly the tensions and the divisions and and the exploitation of power and and exerting control that we saw during the rise of Nazi, Nazi Germany. I think we're now beginning to see too, um, in parts of the world today, and that is becoming embroiled within within um, within sport. And again, the book tries to, to to capture this and to understand it. It's very clear, yeah. But uh, but what I would say is 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 that clearly there are some disagreements, um, some divisions within global sport. And if we take the Qatar World Cup in twenty twenty two as as an example, and 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 we we've got several chapters on on Qatar yeah. and and the World Cup in twenty twenty two, we saw several uh, European and North American teams going to the Qatar World Cup, absolutely determined to wear armbands uh, in support of LGBTQ plus communities. Um, they were vehement about that. I think mm -hmm. arguably the most vehement were the, were the Danish and the, and the Germans. And, and some people may recall the German national team um, protesting before one of the World Cup games by putting their hands yes. over their mouths because they've been told you can't wear uh, this armband. It was a conflict about values. Yeah. But the armband debate developed because then uh, a lot of Arab football fans who were in Qatar for the World Cup started wearing an armband in support of Palestinian cause. Mm -hmm. So there was a battle of the armbands, mm -hmm. and and really this was this was about the different values that people think are important. And for me, that that one month in Qatar was was it was almost like a a, a battlefield of ideologies mm -hmm. rather than a football tournament mm -hmm. in terms of what people value, what they think is important. And I, I suppose the way to, to sum this up, and, and I invite people who watch this and, and who look at the book, is, is to think that to think about it that your values are not necessarily that you, their values. And when it comes to staging sporting events, when it comes to making decisions about the future of sport, um, it's really important that we understand and are able to reconcile those things because if we are to continue with a global sport system, and the last 100 years has essentially been sport has essentially been based upon a global system you know the IOC and FIFA and FIBA and others it's based on on us on a on a kind of consensual global um, system of governance but we are now in danger if we can't agree on a way forward together as a global community of of sport beginning to to splinter and fragment mm -hmm. and if we take esports as an example uh, already there is a battle in esports 
for who or what will be acknowledged as, as the global governing body of esports. And already we're seeing some countries, for example, China, where you have organizations that have been created, so set up by Chinese, located in, in, in China, with sets of rules developed by Chinese people. Um, they see themselves as being the true global governing body of esports. Now, in five years' time or ten years' time, whether that's true is, is, is an interesting issue. But what we are beginning to see is, is almost as you know, groups of people and countries making a play for you know, who, who, who controls sport. Because if you control sport, as I say, you decide where sport is staged, who the sponsors are, what rules apply, whether you think about a particular set of human rights or you don't. And so we, we, I think over the next five to ten years, we're going to live in this really quite turbulent period. Mm -hmm. Alors Simon, on arrive déjà à, notre, à la dernière question euh, que j'aurais voulu vous poser. Elle concerne un sujet qui nous touche tous, euh, le changement climatique, climate change. Euh, à certains égards, le sport contribue au changement climatique. On imagine des dizaines de milliers de personnes qui voyagent en avion, etc. Mais on oublie parfois que le sport est également affecté par le dérèglement climatique. Et pourrait-on aller jusqu'à dire que le sport et les manifestations sportives eh bien, pourraient s'emparer des défis euh, liés au changement climatique et donc en quelque sorte euh, nous aider peut-être à les résoudre. So it's very clear that uh, sport in the 21st century is being shaped by what I would say are three giga changes. I call them giga changes because they're so deep and so profound and so widespread. So one is globalization and and I think the the, the system of sport we have globally now is a, is a an outcome of globalization. Second is digitalization, um, the internet, social media, artificial intelligence, the metaverse, you know, really, really important. But the third one is, is broadly the environment and climate change. So massive disruptions. Mass, massive disruption. It is, it is in, impacting all aspects of sport and will continue to mm -hmm. do so. Again, if I could take you back to, to some of the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, for example, incredibly dependent upon revenues derived from oil and gas, uh, exposed because obviously as the climate changes and, and as the world turns against fossil fuels, they need to diversify their economy. So one part of what they're trying to do is, is to invest in sport as a means of diversifying their, their economies. So we, we, we know that, that sport and, and the environment are, are deeply intertwined. But I think there are two further things to say. The, the first one is, is, is sport has contributed to climate change and for the time being at least will no doubt continue to contribute to climate change. If you take, for example, um, an Olympic Games, uh, when you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people getting on planes, planes. Hmm? flying to a country elsewhere in the world, spending two weeks for the Olympics, two weeks for the Paralympics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. drinking soft drinks, uh, eating fast food and whatever else it is. The, the environmental footprint of, of such an event is it's massive. It's massive. And if we think, you know, it, whilst we're talking about the Olympic Games, if we think, think about what in England we would call white elephant venues. So you use tons and tons and tons of concrete and steel and plastic to create a stadium that then is not used for anything else once, yeah. once it's over. So you know, there's absolutely no doubt that sport has contributed to climate change. Yeah. And, and this is something that I think leads to the, to the third point that I would make about climate change is sport can make a difference. In so, that's what way? But it, it can make a difference in terms of taking the environment more seriously. It is the responsibility of sport to, to, to think about how it can make a contribution to stopping some of the changes that we've seen take place, but also making a positive contribution in, in terms of setting an example and, and leading. And we are seeing instances of this now. So we are seeing a much bigger commitment to um, multi-use venues, for example. So you don't create a venue just for an event. Mm -hmm. They become mm -hmm. venues that, that the local community can use and, and so forth. If we think about one of the, the biggest Um, sources of, of, of waste at a, at, a, at a game or a match or an event, you know, things like um, fast food and, and, and disposable dr drinks cups. You know, we, we're now seeing different technologies being used to 
um, either dispose of, of that waste or alternatively in the way in which those those items are made in the first place so they do become more environmentally mm-hmm. sustainable. But we're also seeing, for instance, uh, uh, changes in, in design. Um, we know that some stadiums throughout the world are being cr- uh, constructed from from wood f- sourced from from sustainable uh, sustainable sources. But I think beyond that, it's 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 for everyone to take action. So it's not just for governing bodies or for clubs or for teams or for venues. It's also about fans and the public too, mm-hmm. because it's not unusual for many of us to, particularly as Europeans, if we think about UEFA Champions League, for example, you know, on a Tuesday we jump on a low cost airline and we fly to you know, we fly to Paris or we fly to Munich or wherever right. else it is. Um, we watch a football game and then we fly back again. And, and there is a consequent, environmental consequence of this. Yes. So I think even things like how fans travel, how they move around, and this could have, in the longer term, this could have consequences for people who attend games. I mean, it could well be that, that people travel less mm-hmm. or they look towards more environmentally sustainable ways of traveling. Um, I know that some cities are looking at enabling people to... Uh, to travel and, and to, to move around cities in a, in a more environmentally sustainable way. We have a, a, a Rugby World Cup coming in France later this year. And I know certainly some of the work, for example, in Nice, um, the city of Nice, which is a world, Rugby World Cup venue, is taking this whole issue of environmental sustainability seriously. And so they're looking for, for fans, people who go to the city to watch rugby, to move around the city in, in ways that don't leave uh, a, a significant environmental footprint. So... It's a big issue. People may not think too seriously about the environment and sport right now, but I think we have to because we are complicit in it having uh, brought about a negative change in our climate. But we can do things. We can make differences. And what happens over the next 10, 20, 30 years in, in sport, I think, will be an outcome of, firstly, the climate and, and, and how the climate is changing, but secondly, how we as members, members of the sport community address some of those changes. Merci, merci pour ces mots. Alors je crois, Simon, qu'on a, on a bien compris que votre livre, en fait, est eh bien en quelque sorte un méta-discours. Il permet d'aller beaucoup plus loin sur le sport que parfois les commentaires qu'on peut entendre. Et que grâce à, grâce à ce, ce, ce livre, on peut, je crois, approcher le sport dans toute sa diversité et, et comme vous l'avez dit à l'instant, euh, adresser un certain nombre de sujets qui vont, encore une fois, de l'économie, la géopolitique, jusqu'aux questions climatiques. Merci, Simon. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Bonne journée. Merci.